What's up guys? Welcome to the first episode of Evo Insights. I'm Kelsey Kotako and I'm here with Ricky Belavo and Dave Seymour. For those of you guys that don't know them, <laughs> Ricky Belavo is the owner of Ball May Capital and you might know Dave from the show Flipping Boston. Yeah. So I think that's where most people would recognize you from, would you say yeah, so? Yeah, maybe. I mean, look, we did Flipping Boston for what, like four or five seasons, something like that. Uh, we had a nice little run with it. It's funny, even uh, even today, you know, you might walk through an airport or something and, and you get, hey, that's, that's the him, guy. that's the guy. That's him. <laughs> there was one couple one time, they were sitting there and they were trying to take a picture with their, with their camera <laughs> in, a, in a restaurant at an airport. But yeah, I'm known as, as the, you know, the contractor attitude dude from, from flipping Boston. But this is a different environment altogether. So I'm excited to do this and hang out with you guys. for a Yeah, while. we're excited to have you on. You guys did an interview a few months back. Yeah. So since then, what, what has changed? I know you guys talked a lot about how you got started and yeah. all that. Yeah, yeah. Look, people always want to know how, you know, and I'm sure you get the same thing, right? Right. They want to know how did you end up getting where you are? A lot of people right. want to do what we do at different levels. Absolutely. You know, some people want to be investors. Some people want to buy the single family house, fix it, flip it. And then some lunatics like you want to build these huge, these huge build towers, build towers <laughs> in, in Boston. But, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't personally, I didn't come from a, from a background uh, that was specifically oriented towards real estate. Which is crazy. Right? But you're so successful now and you didn't really have much of a background. Yeah, look, I was, I was a firefighter and a paramedic on the North Shore, but I was also, a, right? I was a financial illiterate too, <laughs> yeah. right? I was really good at spending more than I earned. So I had some financial challenges and I knew there was money in real estate. I got educated and I just went for it. I mean, I don't think, I look, I know that we can agree as professionals in real estate that you can't do it with, with half measures. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we were saying before we started filming here, like you go in with 100%, it's gonna, it's gonna kill. It's gonna, it's gonna be a fantastic, you know, uh, business model. So, you know, I, I've done the same thing. I'm, I'm ultra conservative because I use a lot of other people's capital. But at the same time, it uh, you know if you buy them right, the results speak for themselves, and I'm sure we'll get into that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and as well. I mean, what I want to know is like you guys are both very successful, but do very different things in mm. a similar space, right? In the real estate world, investing, things like that. So, what separates you from somebody else? Is it the relationships that you have, the connections, the skill set? Is it you know? I'm curious to know. Go for yeah, it. Dave. No, I mean, I think what's, you know, it all starts out with, you know, I think it's understanding the business, right? And so I think, you know, I, I learned step by step as this business grew. I didn't jump into building large scale buildings. Right away. Right? I started out with three family where I, you know, did the work myself, you know, got my hands dirty and, and understood it and then worked my way up to where I am today, right? And I think we're. Time. Yeah, it's a lot of time, right? It's been over 10 years now. And I think, where you see people fault, you know, falter in this business is when they try to jump into something they're not prepared for. Right. right. And I think with what Dave's doing now is, you know, we can talk, you know, he started out with the smaller projects and then now worked into raising large capital and doing a large hundred million dollar fund. That's the same thing. He had, if he had done that when he first got started, he'd be in jail because it'd, <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be illegal. Take, take, yeah. take me away. Yeah, take yeah. him away. Because uh, yeah, he shouldn't real. be investing other people's yeah. money. But then you learn and you kind of grow. I, lo I love what you said because you said you bought a three decker, and only in New England would, do we know what a three decker is. But you know, you bought a three decker and you grafted, you learned, right? You got splinters. I've still got calluses from the days that I was, you know, working on an auger in January trying to get down four feet to put in the deck. Yeah. So I think I agree with you one hundred percent. It's critical that there's a foundation in real estate. And look, man, it's you can read something in a book. Right, you can watch somebody else. Yeah, there's a lot of material. Done. Right, and and look, what you see in a book doesn't really give you what you need yeah. to get the hands-on experience. And I think that's the that's the foundation for our success is actually not only knowing it but doing it, and then implementing it and bringing the right people along. You know, at the same time, because I'm like you, man. I was in construction too. You know, I, I I worked that road prior to the real estate side of it. And then transition to to grow my business. So, and look, man, I'm I'm 50 years old today. <laughs> uh, actually, it's my birthday in a couple of weeks. I'll be 54, and I, I don't want, you know, I don't want to go back to what I used to do. Look, today, I like to use relationships and my brain and my skill sets that I've developed 
to be able to, you know, to, to, to work on a larger scale. And you do the same thing, man. You're like me, you're on the phone all day long. Busy, busy. Right? All day long, that's what we do, right? So one question that we had on social media, which I think was interesting, is looking at your your goals and as they, yeah. your dreams as they started until they are now. Yeah. I think it's, people always ask me that, and you know, you know, so when you were starting out and you were looking at five or 10 years or 20 years yeah. out, yeah. where did you see yourself? And how does that compare to where you are today? And is there anything you look back and tell yourself back 10 years ago? Sure. sure. Those are great questions, brother. Look, I've heard that so many times. I don't care who you are, how old you are, or where you are. Have a goal. Have something to work towards. Write it down. Document it. Believe it. Act as if, right? Like yeah. the, the, those philosophies. Entrepreneurs are, are the only people who really understand the power of, 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 of like vision and, and goal setting and implementation. But for me, I, I, my goals were all short-term goals because I was in a rough place. Yeah. I'm going to be honest with you. Right, which is crazy. I mean, I've heard your, your background story. So like you, you had some debt and then, you know, over time you were mm -hmm. able to, I mean, you're in a completely different position yeah. now, which is- Look, when insane. I started, look, when I started, my FICO score was two. All right, maybe three on a real good day. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I say that in a joking manner, but goal setting was important. I, I wanted to be able to sleep eight hours and not worry anymore. That was right. a goal for me. And you know, my first deal was a little wholesale deal. I made $5,000 and I went, oh, I made 5000 and it felt illegal to me because I didn't oh actually God. own a house. I'd moved the contract. Right. Just curious, what was your first deal, your first real estate it transaction? It was a wholesale, wholesale transaction. It was right at the time when, when the market tanked. And in 2008, if you told people you were in real estate, they thought you had leprosy. You know what I mean? It was like, people were like, get away from me. And I wholesaled a, 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 a bank owned asset. I put it under contract and I sold the contract so, to another Yeah. Guy. So how did, for people who don't know and sure. understand wholesaling, because it's a great business for someone who's getting started. Right. Talk through the idea of a wholesale deal and how someone does a wholesale. Yeah, first of all, in real estate, you have to know your numbers. You gotta know what something will sell for. You're after repair value, right? That's your back number, what it will sell for. And then what you do is, is you take that number and you take off the profit that an investor will want to make, put 20% of the after repair value on there. Then your construction costs, right? What's it going to take to fix it up and make it beautiful? And then you need to put in there 10% of the ARV, which is your carrying cost, cost to buy, cost to sell, et cetera, et cetera. And then as a wholesaler, add a little bit more to that profit margin. So now what you do is, is you basically sell your equitable interest in this property to another investor. So you're a seller, I'm an investor, you're an investor. You put it under contract with me for 200. I put the contract over to you as an investor for 205. You go close that deal with this seller and I make $5,000 in the middle. That, that's the short version. There's a lot more to it I'm than sure that. A lot but more to it yeah, than. yeah. I think where it, the main thing, this is where I see so many people mess up, is you have to understand the value of the asset. You've got right. to. So many yeah. wholesalers yeah. Yeah. don't understand the actual value of what a guy like me or Dave would pay. Right. Then they call me up and they say, hey, I've got an awesome opportunity for you. I, I've got it. I'm, I'm not, I got it for you for nine twenty five, and I go. Well, well, I'll pay you eight twenty five, and right. they go. Oh, well, that's that's less than I have it under agreement. I go. That's, that's not my problem. Your numbers are that's wrong. Your, that's your problem. You know the sidebar of that, and and look, we, I think we all appreciate it. Is is amateur investors give our industry a horrible name? All right, because what they do is is they go out there and throw offers out. They tell people they're going to pay cash for an asset. They don't have the cash. Right people then will never trust real estate investors. So for anybody who watches this, don't be a donkey, all right? Don't be a donkey. Don't be a donkey. Go out there. Hashtag, don't do, be a donkey. Don't be a, <laughs> go out there and do it with some intelligence. Get some education underneath you first. Otherwise, you cause problems and you, you really can ruin our industry. Yeah, and you took some type of online course that taught you a little bit about real estate? Yeah, look, I did, I, I, I'm an all in kind of guy. I'm either doing it or I'm not. Right, you're the same way I did firefighting, right? So it wasn't an online course, it was a $27,000 investment <laughs> oh my on my wife's credit cards to go learn the business. And um, she was my first private lender, that's what I tell her every day. But uh, you know, real estate has allowed my wife, because I went all in, I didn't do anything with a half measure, you know, it's allowed my wife, Mary Beth, for example, to not go back to work. She's sure raised she's my kids and she, she appreciates it today. But, you know, everything is scalable, I think, is what's important from that three decker you did to the, you know, the big buildings you're doing today in Boston. And for me, you know, from that five thousand dollar transaction, I built off of that. 
right? I never, I never looked back. And to your point on goal setting, you know, I, I wanted to get out of debt. I wanted to make sure that my wife could, could raise our boys. I wanted to make sure that I could live in a home that was, was comfortable for us. Uh, I wanted to be able to build a, a good, sustainable business, businesses. Uh, and at each, each uh, step of success, you know, for me personally, I always, I look at our business as being of service, right? We service the people who lend capital to our projects because they can't get returns anything like what we give them yeah. as investors. Uh, we service the communities where we put good housing in there. We service each other because we have realtors and, and developers, et cetera, et cetera, contractors. Yeah. So I love the idea of the fact that we, we employ not just the people in our companies, but we get to help so many people outside of them. And I know, yeah. you know, you and I have talked and you're the same way. Yeah, I think the main point you hit on it, this, people always ask me like, oh, did you, ever, you, did you dream and did you have goals of doing these buildings? Sure. Honestly, no. No. It's always been, right. it's always been like one project grows into the next one and then it's where it goes yeah. well and then there's a bigger one. One, one foot in front of the other. Yeah. And it, so it's never like people are like, oh, you sat back and thought you were going to build huge buildings. And it was, no, I honestly just looked at the next condo conversion and the next building and then they got bigger and you got more knowledgeable yeah. and then and then your network got bigger and bigger deals started coming in and like grow. yeah and as the bill and then now it's crazy I get phone calls like I know what the fuck I'm doing when because like I happen to get one big building permitted now I'm the go-to guy for big buildings it's like just because you did one doesn't mean I'm an right. expert I do right. know how to, I did get one right. you but know you, you know that. it's still there's still a lot of learning to happen I, I love the fact that each each learning experience creates a new, like in medicine, in your brain, when you learn something new, you create what are called synapses in your brain. They're new pathways, for real. Yeah. This is the this is the medical side of it. And every one of those experiences, the good ones that go, yeah, and also the bad ones that go, ooh, right? Yeah. All of those experiences create a new synapse, and we never forget those. So when somebody comes to you, look, man, for, for me, with a TV show, I was an expert as soon as I had a TV show. Right. It didn't matter or anything else. So, you know, I got to go to the head of the line in, yeah, in, in some essences, right? But I learned how to leverage my experiences over and over and over again. Just like when somebody calls you, brother, and they say, you're the guy, be, be the guy. Right. You know that. You know that already. Of course you're the guy. Are. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Leveraging, leveraging business experiences, business relationships, leveraging capital. We're sitting here right now for two reasons. One, we like each other. Two, we're leveraging each other's experience. Right. We talked about it before we even started going on here. Why are we spending our time doing this right now? Because there are some people in my network that will appreciate what you do. Some people in your network will appreciate what we do. And you're, I don't know, you're just, you're here. It's <laughs> awesome to see you, right? Yeah, right? yeah totally. Uh, I'm learning so much just from working with you and, and right. getting to know you. I mean, there is, and with what's going on right now, the pandemic, how have your experiences mm. changed? Like, in, from the business side of things, like I'm sure they're much different than you had yeah. anticipated. Them. Yeah, so. for sure. Do you want to go first on this one? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to the big guy and let him <laughs> let, let him take this one to start it out. I tell you, we we had that uh, initial interaction back in February or whatever it was, and I'll make it a, a shorter version. But um, I was in a hard money lending space, you know, full on. I've I've always had multiple businesses, but hard money lending in February was our focus of attention company had asked me to do some, you know, like marketing or branding, if you will, around hard money. And we had $15 million with the loans in the pipe. I had seven loan originators. It was all great. Everything was ticking over. My marketing team was killing it. It was beautiful. But here's what happened. 90%, and this is important, and you'll back me up on this, 90% of the hard money lenders out there don't have any money, right? They don't. What they do is, is they put themselves in between a, a line of credit and then maybe Wall Street buying these mortgages. They're not called non-QM mortgages. And I learned very, very quickly that the guys I was, in, uh, I was in business with, that was their business model. They didn't control the money themselves. So as soon as COVID hit, I'm out of business, brother. No more money. There's no more money. Because Wall Street says, thank you very much. We're not interested anymore. We want safer loans, right? Safer uh, notes to buy. So, you know, for me, COVID gave me a slap. It gave me an, an awareness um, that created a synapse in my brain. 
And I stepped back and I watched that business deteriorate in three days, literally three days I was out of business. And I said, what the heck am I going to do now? What the, what's the next move? And I just, you know, pray a little, project a little, you know, go into your, into your, your, your core entrepreneur and say, okay, what was wrong here? And how can I pivot on that? And what we did was, was I turned around and I said, look, COVID requires control of capital because we have, we have never seen a bigger transference of money moving right now in, globally, let alone just in the States or Boston or anywhere else, right? Money is moving. Those with capital are putting it all on the sidelines and they're like, we are too freaking scared to do anything. So I looked at all that sideline capital and I said, okay, I'm going to control the money. I'm not going to rely on anybody else's line of credit or anything of that nature. So we went and pivoted 180, like total other direction and began to raise capital, private investor capital for us. Because I know if I can pool a hundred million dollars, I know I can take that capital, deploy it. COVID compliant is what we're calling COVID it, i.e. what's the best strategy in a COVID marketplace. And for us, our company motto is real, real simple. Two words, well, three words, buy cash flow. I'll say it again, buy cash flow. That's it. We have no uh, projection in our business model. We have no, you know, uh, ma maturity in our projects. Um, I don't, I'm not looking at anything, touching anything in my business unless it cash flows because as COVID plays out and the forbearances in the single family market come to come to, to a call in for one of a better term, yeah. the bank says, okay, pay me. Uh, the tenants have to start paying again. Landlords get back into control. You know, um, it's going to create a, a crazy environment in which by cash flow, uh, we, we feel is going to be the absolute uh, mantra for the next 18 to maybe 24 months. And I love the fact that, you know, we went bullish on cash flow, but you brother, you're still bullish on your business model. And we said this before, no right or wrong, right? right? Yeah, you got Yours it. is a longer term strategy. Yeah, and I think, you know, so one thing in our business, right, is, you know, we, I'd always looked at this could happen, right? Not COVID, but a recession, right? right? And so that's kind of why the business got set up in the way where we started out with cash flow, right? The business was built around rentals, right? We had right. about a hundred rental units in Boston. That's our core business. It started out with rentals, cash flow asset, right? Then it, it turned into the development business where we started doing the development, which is still now our core main business, which we're still doing full steam ahead right now. Yeah. But then the property management business, right? Started the property management business, business about three years ago. And the, the real idea behind that was cash flow, right? It's if I'm managing assets, not right. just my own, but others, right? They will be paying every single month, whether or not there's a recession, or whatever happens, right. management business yeah. is a secure business. Yeah. People still need Agreed. property management. So Absolutely. we manage about 400 units now, and that business is has not taken a single tick during COVID. Wow. We still get paid all of our management fees, right? And it, it's it's moving along smoothly. The the rental properties, we've got you know maybe 5% vacancy right now, which is from zero before, um, but we're still obviously bringing in good capital. And then on the development side, you know, we have to look at things in a worst case scenario. So I mentioned to you before yeah. is start to really look at deals and say, what if the worst thing happens, right? And that's whether it's COVID related or zoning related. And I think a lot of investors out there have to start doing that is, is understanding like, it's not all butterflies and roses, right? It's, they're Unfortunately not. Unicorns and rainbows? Unicorns and rainbows. Like we just started, <laughs> we, like we just learned that after 10 years of growth, 15 years of growth, yeah. that, that, that bad things happen, right? And I think people need to look at deals that way. So Yeah, and so like we just did, you know, we have our large project we're coming up and I talked to a mentor of mine this weekend and he was like, Rick, he's like, you have to look at this in the worst case scenario. Mm. He's like, this deal is the biggest of your life how does it work if COVID continues for 24 months right. and the so market, gonna happen. you know, so what we did is we did a, a doomsday analysis and we had our financial team analyze the deal using the section eight voucher program. So if I was to take vouchers from the state and put tenants in there using the city's money, right? Would it cash flow? And it would, right? So if I look at it from that perspective, if right. the building will still cash flow a couple hundred thousand dollars a year with vouchers, 
that relaxed me and I said, okay, in a doomsday scenario, I could Maybe still I cash miss. flow, right? right? right. Yeah. And you know, that, 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 you look at a deal in that fashion, then you, what's the downside? Obviously construction, there's risk there, right. but not as much as if you're gonna lose your, you lose your shirt. Well, you yeah. know what you're talking about on the construction side, that's something, yeah, it can go crazy, but with 10, 15 years of experience, you can, you can keep on guiding that ship along. It's always the variables that we can't control, right? That's where we run a doomsday scenario. Right. And that's so smart that you do it that way because so many investors out there or you know, people who want to invest capital in real estate, they don't understand the reverse engineer scenario from back to front. And we talked about this before the cameras were turned on. And you know, you've done that, man. You've played out worst case scenarios. I was on an investor call a month ago. <clears throat> and one of my investors said to me, Dave, what's the worst thing that can happen? And I looked at, at her right on the Zoom call and I said, you break even. You break even is the worst thing that can happen because no matter what happens in, in the world globally, et cetera, et cetera, real estate will always perform long term. Right. And in my scenario, my investors are in for a five, six year hold, right? And in five, six years, worst case scenario is it's a break even. Right. And it's better than, you know, the bond market right now. <laughs> People are going to the bond market for security not realizing that the bond market's paying three, 2%, right? right? And inflation is three and a half percent. So you're killing money anyway, right. you know? So it's- um... Either way, I feel like there's always risks involved. I think people like, we had a lot of questions come in from people that probably want to get into investing or don't yeah. really know how to get started or have just started and not really sure where it's going to go with what's happening, but there's always a risk, right? I think that's one thing that people probably need to understand is that what you're doing, I mean, you can be conservative because I know sure. you mentioned that you are, but sure. involved. so just out of curiosity, what's the biggest risk within that that you've taken? <sighs> That's a great question. I'm like you, dude. I'm so confident it's in what I do. Be right. I am so, <laughs> seriously. I'm so confident. Always winning. <clears throat> Watch. I'll take a deal right now that we're doing. It's in the final underwriting. It's uh, 104 doors. Um, it's in it's in the southern part of Florida where we buy our apartment complexes. <clears throat> so what is this deal? First of all, this is an assumable loan at 7.5 mil. I can walk into this loan for forty thousand dollars, right? I walk in, I now own it. So why can I own it at forty thousand? And what's the risk component in it? Well, the prior owner has already stripped all the equity out of it. He's done all the exterior work, but he's done no interior work. You know, and I know. Bathrooms and kitchens is where we make our money, whether it's in a single or in these apartment complexes. So what can go wrong in this environment right here? Well, I don't get 1.24 million in additional capital to do the repairs. Um, no, I think I'm gonna be okay there. The other thing is uh, I get bad contractors. No, I got that one covered. I got a 20 year footprint in that marketplace of success doing kitchens and bathrooms. Um, it won't absorb the amount, but even if I take a 10% loss of occupancy, it's still gonna, I, f I make my money when I buy. Like I don't look at any, you know what's risky? Going to work every single day and having somebody else be in control of your financial right. income. That's freaking risky. Or Putting say, your money in a, in a 401k plan, that's yeah. risky. And then you wake up one morning and you don't have a job, which is unfortunately the situation for a lot of people right now. Yeah, I mean, look, we gotta go into these deals with, with as many of the variables controlled as is possible. You know, can, can a media fall out of the sky? Yeah, but my shit's in short. Man. Yeah, I think, <laughs> you, know? you know, I think what scares me from investors is when I hear a newbie investor talk about the future and what that's gonna be worth in the future, yeah. right? And it's yeah. like, if they're yeah. getting into a deal, yeah. and I never buy for appreciation. Like, in my pro forma, we have an appreciation tab, right? And it shows the building's value going up at 2.5% per mm -hmm. year or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's just an upside number, right? You can't rely if, on it. If it doesn't work on a cash flow standpoint, right. Right. I'm not gonna buy it, right? right? So what, what scares me is when I hear someone say like, yeah, but this area, the future value is gonna be up, if this building's gonna be worth $300,000 more in five years, maybe, right? But that should be your, that should be your golden goose. That should be your extra, right? If that's the upside, it should still be making sense on a cash flow basis. Right. Unless you're a fund 
where you're literally just placing capital and looking for the long term. But for mom and pop guys or small investors, that's not what we are. You need to be looking at what this asset's gonna do if the market doesn't go to where Right, how it's gonna perform. Because I think right. I, I hear it all the time, a lot of people are scared to buy right now because they're like, oh, well, what if, what if values drop? Well, it's still you still want it to make sense in that asset. If yeah. your cash flowing and values drop, who cares? Yeah, right, who cares? Who cares? It doesn't matter. Show me one money. piece of real estate which is worth less money today than it was 20 years ago. It doesn't exist, right? So when we buy for that cash flow you know, promise, uh, it, it, uh, it, it makes sense. You said pro forma. One of my first mentors always used to say to me, <clears throat> when you're buying real estate, just replace the word pro forma with pretend. <laughs> and he said there, he said, why, why would you pay the price of a property for somebody who has not done the work to it to make it as valuable as they say it is? Oh, so that's my, isn't opinion. that sweet? Oh my God. That's so true. The thing I hate the most is when I'm going to buy a multifamily and an agent says to me, oh. they say, yeah, but Rick, the market rates for those units is a thousand dollars more per unit. I go, then he gets, get the thousand dollars more and then I'll pay him that number. That's my upside, right? If, if the rents are currently 1500 and, the, and I put it into my pro forma and it spits out that I should only pay 700,000 for the building, right. that's what I should pay. Right. If they go up to from 15 to 25 and now it's worth 900,000, that's my 200 grand. Right. That's for me working with those tenants or working with the renovations and getting it done. Something a lot of people don't even understand. The, the, the words are so simple, but they don't understand. I buy based on actual numbers. Yeah. And they go, what does that mean? I, it means I buy it for what it is today. But you don't, you don't when an owner says to you that they're, they've been renting for 20 years and that the rents are lower than the market, you don't just give them the upside of what the rent should be? No! Oh, isn't that amazing? <laughs> or the real truth comes in and says, all you have to do is spend about 200,000 on this and it's going to be worth a million dollars more. And I say, <laughs> that's fantastic. So you can be my first investor. Stroke me a check for 200,000 and we'll get going on it. Oh, all of a sudden they go, start backpedaling in their high heel shoes. They jump in their freaking Mercedes and drive away, right? <laughs> I only want to be around and with people who understand this business, which is why the education piece, piece is so it's critical huge, as well, absolutely. right? An educated uh, broker or realtor is so much more valuable than an uneducated one, right? Absolutely. Same thing with the construction and, and everything else. So, you know, we're not that far apart. Although I told you you're, you're crazy for building, yeah. we're not because, you know, it's this, the different models, but they've got similar exit strategies. And that's really what real estate is all about, right? Yeah. It's an exit strategy. You're going to build those condos. You've got your worst case scenario in play and it still works. So let's dial it back and then start looking, you know, with the positivity of the upside of what those things can be. And that makes sense as well, for sure, for sure. It's an exciting time. COVID is um, sad. It's, it's, it's horrible. Uh, it's put such a strain on, on first responders, you know, my peeps from my old days. But uh, at the same time, a friend of mine said to me, he said, out of, um, out of misfortune is created fortune, right? Yeah. And, you know, the, the you know, commercial real estate in the, the retail side and hospitality and, you know, those, that's brutal. It's brutal. Yeah. Uh, I watched the thing today, they said the four areas of commercial, the first one to, to go down in, in, a, in any kind of scenario is hospitality. The second is retail. Third is office and light industrial. And fourth, the one that survives the best is multifamily. Yeah. It's always multifamily. It's what we do when people want somewhere to live, they you know, they're going to they're gonna write a check for their mortgage or they're going to write a check for their rent. Yeah. So we're in the right place, bro. And for sure. Of, you know, I know you guys are both so busy and uh, one of the questions that we got is how do you spend your time? Like you've got so much going on, especially with COVID. I think we're all busier, but a little mm. bit less busy day to day, right? Because mm. you can't, you're not mm. going out and about as much as you would be or traveling as much as sure, you would be, sure. right? So what do you, like, what do you do in the morning? Like, what do you do when you wake up in the morning? Um, I, I try and, I try and set my day right. And I'm not, I'd be lying to you, you if I said routine? I, I, I do, like I do. My day by day. My routine, I like to get some water in me when I get up in the morning. 
Uh, I like to try and take 15, 20 minutes, just a little meditation, just a little <laughs> yoga. Set myself. <laughs> yoga. I do, do you really do that? Namaste. I, I try to. <laughs> I try to. I try to do a little guided meditation just to calm me. Look, I'm a lunatic. Once I get going, and <laughs> you know, it, there's there's no time to to be present. So if I'm not present, if I'm not in my skin, if I'm always somewhere else, and it's hard for guys like us, dude, because I've got Absolutely. five thoughts ahead of my my conversation, and then I miss an opportunity to really relate to people. So I try and slow down enough. Then I'll put on a little bit of bullshit on the TV, you know, listen to the silliness of the happened the day before. I give that 15, 20 minutes. Uh, I try and work out. Uh, I get I got a little sauna at home. I like a good sweating in the morning. And then I, I go out and I do my day and I rock and roll. But you know what's what's interesting is is like you, I'm in full on mode right now. So my routine, unfortunately, is not taking care of the people that I love the most because I'm so engrossed in what I got going on. My, my eight year old, he's funny, Bennett, I came home the other day from the office, it's five o'clock, you know, Mary Beth always puts some supper on the table, it's a routine in the house, five o'clock we eat together. So I, I scoff the food, I run in my home office, and I'm on the computer, and, this, and I look, and there's this little body standing there. Aww. My little guy, he's like, he's skinny as a rail, but glasses, <laughs> right? Personality that, that fills up a room, and he goes, Dad, I go, what's up? He goes, pretty sad, you know. <laughs> I go, what is he? Goes, what, me? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, he looks at me and he goes, drops his glasses down. Looks at me over his glasses, Rick. He looks at me and he goes, pretty sad, Dad. You got to work all day. And then you come home and you got to work some more. We need to figure this out. <laughs> what he said to me. Get so lectured. It's like, yeah, I was getting lectured by my own kids. So, you know, my day is full, but I try as best I can to make sure I tick all the appropriate boxes. It's so and it's, and I'm, I'm not good at it. I, I'd be a liar. I don't know how you are with your family. Yeah, I mean, it's tough. you know, I think I, you know, through COVID, I think I have gotten the chance with obviously not being able to be in the office and right. a lot of stuff has moved to Zoom, which has been awesome from a yeah. neighborhood meeting perspective. We do a lot of neighborhood meetings, right. CBA meetings, like all that I can do, you know, been doing from my vacation house. So I've been able to spend time with my family. Um, but I think it, it definitely has messed with my routine. Right? I used to get up every day, 6 a.m., go to the out gym, the 6 30, yeah. I mean, yeah. from 6.30 to 8.30 at the gym, yeah. out in the office or working, and like that would be how I'd start my day. And then COVID, I haven't been to the gym you know, since February, and like then what ends up happening is you start sleeping in, and it just yep, starts to break. Yeah. Well, we don't care about that because these cameras are the skinny yeah, cameras. Yeah, the skinny remember? cameras. We talked to the guy before yeah. we started. Chris. Skinny <laughs> cameras, Chris. Um, <laughs> But I think, you know, I think they only work on her though. Yeah. <laughs> they ain't working on us. Um, but yeah, I think overall, I'm kind of looking at, you know, everything that's going on and like, I'm trying to figure out, you know, can I, you know, can we look at all aspects of the business and start to kind of clean it up, right? I feel like COVID was kind of like a whirlwind tornado. Right. Things yeah. kind of went all over. Yeah. The, the development business has kind of been all scattered. We're getting so many projects. We've got big projects starting. The rental business has gone crazy because we've got tenants not paying. The management business is kind of, so now it's, I'm looking at, you know, the, the rest of this year is kind of, let's step back. Clean it up. Let's, evaluate. Bre- let's, let's evaluate, let's breathe and kind of let's see where COVID takes us and let's let's take all the stuff that's currently on the table and get it really organized. Nice. Right? And so like that's that's how I'm looking at between now and 2021 is like let's put let's get everything in order so that heading into next year we can make the right decisions, right? So uh, it's it's kind of been crazy 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 and now it's let's stabilize everything. Let's let's analyze the management business. Let's make sure everything is flowing properly. Let's look at the rental portfolio. Yeah. Let's go sit down with those tenants who aren't paying. Let's really try to, to see if we can maximize that business. And then looking at the condo projects coming up and saying, all right, which ones are we gonna build? Are we gonna sell some? You know, Are we gonna build everything? Are we gonna hold some for the long term? I'm trying to make those decisions and, and then go into next year with you know not being as much of a tornado right yeah right. So, having, having a definitive it's tough plan to slow yourself down. yeah having yeah. a definitive plan for 21 22 i think is critical dude yeah, yeah. Absolutely. you know that knee-jerk reaction you just summed it up but everybody has had to COVID. you know you can't live like that you can't do business like that you can't be in a family like that you know it's kind of crazy yeah and i think once i kind of sat down and came up with this plan it actually removed a lot of anxiety from mm-hmm. me mm-hmm. and it was it, perform better yeah and it made me just it made me just like step back and be like hey let's just get things organized 
and then mm. we can progress in the right way in this business. Mm. And a lot of the past 12 months, like I've been, you know, we've bought so much real estate, we've permitted so many projects. It's been a great couple of years, but now with COVID and everything, it's time to, it's time to organize and, and kind of ride the waves. Right. I think that everyone kind of needs to look at the end of this year when there's unknowns you can't predict, you need to be stable, mm. right? And keep your you balance. Control, exactly. Right? Yeah. So. You feel like I know when we talked in the start of COVID, I said that exact quote. I said, everybody, control what you can control. We can't control what's happening yeah. in the world. Yeah. Control your business. Sit at your computer, work with your architects, work with your engineers, work with your staff, figure out what you can do really well from home. Yeah. Now it's the same thing. Yeah. Right? It's tough to say. One thing that I always think is like it's it's easy to get stressed, especially when you're busy and you've got so much going on and you know, who knows what's gonna happen, but try not to stress about the things that you can't control because it does, it adds no value, right? For sure, yeah. for sure. People spend a lot of time trying to control the uncontrollable. Yeah, right? you know? and, then, and then, you know, they're bloodied and beaten six months, eight months later, and then they give up. Yeah. I know a guy used to say to it, stop white knuckling it, dude. I'd say, what do you mean? White he said, you're holding up so tight to everything, your knuckles are white. Let it go, right? Right? Yeah. let go of some of that stuff. Yeah. So. Definitely, uh, definitely a strategy for, for, for towards the end of the year is to, that's actually good stuff, man, because there's things that are still kind of like chaotic over here in the background for me, shit that I got to clean up. <laughs> yeah. just, I just liquidated a hundred doors up in Sanford, Maine, yeah. you know, and it was like, uh, get them off the you plate, know, get, them off the play, yeah. get them, get them done, get the capital in. So you've got some, some depth to grow. So it's good. Yeah. It's good for sure. So before we wrap up, is there anything that you want to leave people with? Um, any, any advice that you have for somebody right now that isn't, you know, that wants to get to your level? Mm. Educate. <laughs> I, I, yeah, that's always a great question. The very first TV interview we ever did after the show went out was on Squawk Box. You know, the show yeah. Squawk Box. So there's me and my ex-partner, Pete, and we were actually sitting in a booth in downtown Boston somewhere that was connected to, to New York. And they said, you know, for somebody who wants to be in this business or do what you do, you know, what, what would you advise them? What would you say to them? And I, I coined a phrase then and I've used it ever since. And it's real simple. Educate, don't speculate. Right. Educate, you know, don't speculate. you don't earn that. the right to be a developer. Like you said, in one week, you don't earn right. the right to be a hundred million dollar fund manager in a week because you read rich dad, poor dad. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, that's not your qualification to that's a beginning it's not an end so educate don't speculate uh and be truthful with yourself right guy said to me one time three o'clock in the morning is the only time we're really honest with ourselves because there's nobody else around it's yeah. the stuff that keeps guys like yes. us awake yeah. right you wake up with it at three in the morning you got to face whatever it is be truthful at that moment in time and then execute on it don't don't keep on procrastinating yeah and i, I think you know from the standpoint of someone who's getting started it's like I think it's who you surround yourself with, right? Excellent. Like for we, sure. you know, we met we met through COVID. Like I reached right. out and I was like, hey, like you know, let's chat. Yeah. And I think by you know, and same with some other mentors I have that I reach sure. out to and get advice from. And I think sure. you know, people are like, oh, Rick, you don't, you know, you're so experienced. It's like, no, like I still reach out to people who have been in the business who know longer more than you. and have seen different things. And like I think I've always been someone who's been completely open to reaching out. Even if I have never met the person and they're extremely successful, bigger developers than I am, and been like, "Hey, can I grab coffee? Can we grab dinner? Like, can can you can I get you get yeah. some of your time?" And I think yeah. if you're getting started, there's nothing better that you can do than surround yourself with people that yeah. are like minded. For sure. And you know, I know at Evo, like that's something that we're trying to do with our brokerage. Is like, if you when you work here, the environment of everyone is like minded. Like, we have goals. They want to succeed. Entrepreneurial. And like, when you put all of us in a room together, you can feel that energy. And I think. You know, find that in your life, right? Find a place where you can, you know, get people around you that, you know, and if that's not your current job, you know, try to find it outside of work. And if it's not there, maybe, you know, maybe it's yeah. not the right place for you. So. Yeah, and so speaking of that, where can people find you? I know, I mean, you're on Instagram, Facebook. Yeah, so yeah, you can find, the easiest way to get in touch with me is you just go to Volney Capital's Instagram. You can send me a DM right there. And how about you, Dave? Um, yeah, are you an Instagram I'm not guy? on America's Most Wanted anymore, <laughs> so that that's good. You can't find me there. Um, I've I've got all that stuff. Yeah. Dave Seymour three four three, I think, is uh, is the Instagram tag. Or just just yeah. grab us at Freedom Venture Investments. You can you can yeah, find we'll us there. we'll tag Dave in yeah. the in the post and yeah. you know, in, yeah. in the video and uh, yeah. Thanks so you much for coming in. It was great to have you on again. I mean, I I can't wait to see this one go live. Yeah.
Excellent, thanks. Thanks, Kelsey.